Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm so glad to see you here today as we mark Reformation Day 2022. My name is Karin Mogg, and I am the director of the Meter Center for Calvin Studies. And it is the Meter Center that has the pleasure and the privilege of sponsoring and organizing today's panel. We warmly invite you to be here. I'm glad many of you have already found the refreshments and you can continue enjoying the refreshments after the formal part of the presentation is over. The practice of commemorating the Reformation on October 31st emerged early in the German lands, even as early as only some 50 years after Martin Luther's 95 theses were posted in Wittenberg. German commemorations of October 31st as Reformation Day, that being the day associated with Luther posting his 95 theses. These German commemorations continued with major celebrations at the centenary anniversaries, right? So in 1617, in 1817, in 1917, and most recently, obviously, for the 4 500th in 2017. The practice of marking Reformation Day on October 31st then spread to other countries and to other confessional groups, not just among the Lutherans in Germany, but worldwide among Presbyterians and Methodists and all sorts of other Protestant groups who wanted to think again about the roots of the Reformation movement as it shaped their own denomination. Some churches do uh, choose instead to mark the occasion on the Sunday closest to October 31st, which is then Reformation Sunday in those churches. But today, well, it's October 31st, it's Reformation Day, so we're going to have our panel on the very day itself. We are marking and remembering the impact of the Reformation. This time around, not so much by going all the way back to the 16th century, but by considering the wider influence of the Reformation movement, specifically by reflecting together on the global impact of the Reformed faith. So today we have three presenters and three areas of the world to highlight. Our presenters, I'm going to announce each one of them in turn, and then they will come up in turn. We'll have the question and answer following all three presentations. Our presenters today... Dr. Yuda Thianto, who is professor of the history of Christianity and Reformed theology. He will speak on the impact of the Reformed faith in Indonesia. We will then hear from Dr. Jean Gomez, who is pastor of discipleship at First Byron CRC in Byron Center. He is also a 2022 graduate of the PhD program at Calvin Theological Seminary. And then we will hear from Sam Ha, who is a PhD student here at Calvin Theological Seminary. He will speak on the impact of the Reformed faith in South Korea. Uh, Jean Gomez will be speaking on the impact of the Reformed faith in Brazil. So you've got Indonesia, Brazil, and South Korea. We are delighted to introduce these talented and knowledgeable speakers to you. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you, Karin. Thank you for the invitation. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. If there is no legitimate objection, sent confidentially to the elders of the church by Thursday, October 20th, 2022, the church will officiate the wedding of Handi Kurniawan Hartono, the son of Mr. and Mrs. Budi Hartono, and Diana Santoso, the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Lukman Santoso, on Saturday, October 22, 2022. The congregation is invited to witness the wedding. That was an actual ban of marriage, read on three successive Sundays before service began, starting on October 2, 2022, at the Indonesian Christian Church in Samarang, Indonesia, a church I still call home when I am in the country. It is still customary in most churches in Indonesia that bans of marriage are read before church service starts during three successive Sundays prior to the wedding day. This is just one of the many practices that the churches in Indonesia inherited from the Dutch Reformed Church centuries ago and still keep 
today, regardless of their denominational affiliations. Tracing its roots in history, I can confidentially say that this practice was brought by the Dutch Reformed ministers to the land we now call Indonesia at the time when the Dutch started to colonize the East Indies in the early 17th century. The custom of publicizing the bans of marriage, the formal public announcement that a couple intend to get married at church, was one that received a lot of emphasis in Calvin's Geneva at the time of the Reformation. While the bands themselves were common in the medieval era, before the Reformation, there were some issues in the medieval church between its view of marriage as a sacrament and the way it saw a mar when a marriage happened. Seeing that marriage is a sacrament, the medieval church thought that it started with sex. A couple, therefore, can have sex without feeling guilty of having committed a sin when they are married. In those days, a couple could come to a tavern, drink in the name of marriage in the presence of a witness, and they are considered married. This would cause a lot of problem in people's lives, including the breaking of the marital promise, unclarity of the couple's status, whether they are married or not, and many others. In Geneva, Calvin and the company of pastors worked very hard to ensure that marriages are lawful, clandestine marriage or secret marriages avoided, and weddings are performed at church. Gone would be the days when two people went to a tavern and drank in the name of marriage. The 1541 ecclesiastical ordinances of the church in Geneva clearly stipulated concerning marriage that, here I quote, after the calling of the customary bands, the espousals shall be performed when the parties request it, whether on Sundays or on workdays, provided that it is done only at the beginning of public worship, end quote. Following the formal practice of the medieval church, the church in Geneva declared that the bans of marriage were to be announced for three consecutive Sundays, and the couple should be married within six weeks of the announcement. As the practice of making marital bans uh, was also held in the Reformed Church in the Netherlands in the 16th and 17th centuries, it was no surprise that the same was applied to the Reformed Churches in the East Indies when the Dutch transplanted Reformed Protestantism in the archipelago. Interestingly, when the colonial era ended and the Dutch left the East Indies, the practice remains a standard in all churches in Indonesia, including the ones that do not hold Reformed theology as their foundation. This is an example of how the impact of the Reformation still holds strongly in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia particularly. There are many other practices such as this, and by looking at them, we can see how the global Reformation, how global the Reformation and uh, its influence are. In the interest of time, today I will highlight two of these uh, ecclesial matters. Number one is church liturgy, together with the, the congregational singing, and the role of office bearers, particularly, particularly that of pastors or ministers. By looking together what the Reformed churches in both Geneva and in the Netherlands did at the time of the Reformation and today's practices in the churches in Indonesia, I intend to show that the last, uh, that the lasting impacts of the Reformation are still strong in that part of the world, and that we as a church worldwide stand on a common ground with churches around the world. Now, liturgy and congregation singing. One of the discontinuities between the medieval church and the Reformation was the shift from mass to service. Whereas the mass was mainly run by the priests without much involvement of the people at the pews, except when they, when they receive uh, the bread from the priests, Protestant services involve the congregation, most notably in the congregational singing. When Calvin was in Strasbourg from 1538 to 1541, the time between his first and second ministries in Geneva, he was enamored by the way the French-speaking church there uh, sang the metrical psalms. In Strasbourg, men, women, and children sang the psalms in French. And already in Strasbourg in 1539, Calvin published his Psalter, containing five of his own falsifications and the other 12 done by Clement Marot. When he returned to Geneva in 1542, he published the Liturgy of the Church in Geneva, La Forme des Prières et Chants Ecclesiastiques, which in English uh, has the uh, the title, The Form of Church Prayers and Hymns with the Manner of Administering, uh, administering the Sacraments and Consecrating Marriage According to the Custom of the Ancient Church. 
This Psalter, La Forme des Prières, um, has 35 versified psalms as well as three canticles, the Song of Simeon, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments, all in the metrical form. Liturgy for regular church service, liturgy for communion, and, uh, and that of wedding ceremony follow the metrical psalms and canticles in the La Forme des Prières. The liturgy of Sunday worship service in this book starts with the minister saying the photon taken from Psalm 121, verse 2. Our help, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. It is then followed by the confession of sins. In the Strasbourg liturgy, the minister would then read some passages from scripture to comfort the repentant people, and then he would say the absolution. In the Geneva liturgy, the prayer of the confession of sins is followed by the singing of a psalm. The prayer for the reading of scripture follows the singing of the psalm, and then the minister preaches the sermon. The sermon would then followed by a relatively long prayer to show gratitude to God of the salvation that he has given to the people through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the Strasbourg liturgy, the congregation would sing the versified form of the first table of the Ten Commandments, after which the minister would lead the prayer asking God to lead the, uh, the people in holy living. After the prayer for the, of the guide for holy living, the co congregation would sing the second table of the Ten Commandments. In the liturgy of the Reformed Church in Strasbourg, we also find the singing of the versified form of the Apostles' Creed on the Sundays that the church celebrated the Lord's Supper. The Reformed Church's liturgies from Geneva and Strasbourg were adopted by the Reformed Church in the Netherlands in the latter half of the 16th century, and when the Dutch sailed to the East Indies in the early decades of the 17th century, they transplanted the liturgy in the newly established Reformed Churches there. As early as 1629, the Dutch translated some metrical psalms and canticles into Malay, one lingua franca in the East Indies, published together with the Malay translation of the Gospel of Matthew. In the collection of the Psalms and Canticles, the versified form of the Ten Commandments took center stage as the first one on the list, followed by the Song of Zechariah, the Gloria in Excelsis Deo, the Magnificat, the Song of Simeon, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, and several other uh, canticles, all in metrical forms, including songs for before and after the sermon, morning prayer, evening prayer, prayers for before um, and prayers for before and after each meal. The inclusion of these canticles indicated that this very early form of Malay Psalter hymnal was intended for the use in both church services and private devotions at people's homes. The translations of the Psalms and canticles into Malay showed how the Dutch kept the tradition of singing the psalm and these ecclesiastical songs alive in the East Indies. Now, interestingly, the main structure of the liturgies of the Reformed churches in Strasbourg and Geneva is well kept in the Reformed churches in Indonesia also until today, long after the Dutch left the East Indies and Indonesia gained its independence. When you go to most churches in Indonesia that are within the Reformed tradition, you will likely find yourself hearing the minister or the liturgist starts a worship service on Sunday with the same photon. We begin this worship service in the name of God, the creator of heaven and earth. After this photum, the minister will then deliver God's greetings to the congregation. I remember this practice since I was a young boy growing up in Indonesia. Every time I went to church in Indonesia at that time, and also now when I go back to the country when I visit, I always find the joy and the peace in my heart at the beginning of every service on Sunday. The same is not just kept in Reformed churches in Indonesia, but I have also seen it done in the churches in Singapore and Hong Kong. This is just remarkable. The recitation of the Apostles' Creed is still well kept in almost all churches in Indonesia every Sunday, regardless of their denomination. While in the past, the church tended to sing the Apostles' Creed, today the churches uh, in this region choose to straightforwardly recite it. I can see that even with a shift from singing to recitation, this 
that this one element in the liturgy of the Reformed Church remains alive in these churches. In countries where Christianity is not the pre predominant religion, it is important for believers to be reminded and to remind each other of the backbone of their Christian belief expressed in the Apostles' Creed. And growing up in a historically reformed church in Indonesia, I still remember that the reading of the Ten Commandments was also a standard feature in the liturgy of the church up until the 1980s, and then it was uh, kind of dwindling. I understand how significant it is for the people at church to hear the reading of the Ten Commandments as a reminder of how they could live according the, to the law of God as an expression of gratitude of the salvation that God has given us in Christ. And it is also equally important to understand that the, this liturgy follows one of the historic lit liturgy of the church in the past. In this case, it was the one from Strasbourg because we want to maintain the unity with historic Christianity. In the church in Geneva, on the Sunday before the church celebrated the Lord's Supper, the minister would remind the congregation to prepare their hearts so that they would repent from sin so that they, were, they are worthy to celebrate the Lord's Supper. This practice is clearly also spelled out in the La Femme des Prières. As we know, the church in Geneva celebrated the Lord's Supper four times a year. In most churches within the Reformed tradition in Indonesia today, the sacrament is also still celebrated four times a year. In keeping with the practice of the church at the time of the Reformation, these churches in Indonesia still remind and prepare the congregation regarding the, upcom uh, the upcoming communion. On the Sunday prior to the sacrament, the pastor takes the time to remind the people and also to lead a prayer of repentance so that the congregation will be ready to partake in the Lord's Supper the following Sunday. Now, roles of office bearers, especially ministers. In most Reformed churches in Indonesia today, there are three offices that require ordination, ministers, elders, and deacons. Reformed churches in Indonesia that I know follow very strict regulation in electing calling and ordaining pastors in the local congregations. The affirmation of three offices in the Reformed churches in Indonesia shows a slight discontinuity with the customs of the church in Geneva and in the Netherlands. In Calvin's Geneva, the church recognized four offices, ministers, teachers, elders, and deacons. The same was also true regarding the Reformed church in the Netherlands in the 17th century under the church order of the Synod of Dort of 1618-1619. The 1541 ecclesiastical ordinances of the Church of Geneva stated that the election and calling of the ministers should follow the following procedure, examination, agreement of all the ministers in the church about the candidate, and the ordination ceremony. The ecclesiastical ordinances also stated that the examination should focus on the candidate's solid doctrinal knowledge and upright moral way of life. The church order of the Synod of Dort followed the one of Geneva almost up to a T, with an addition that this process must be done by the classes. The church order of the Reformed churches in Java in Indonesia does not depart too much from both the church in Geneva and that in the Netherlands. It states, the, the church order of the church in Java, it states that the election for a new minister in a local congregation should be done from within the particular classes who will then visit the local congregation and provide step-by-step -step guidance for the church in the process. It stipulates that the examination of the candidate focuses on their spiritual life and conduct as well as depth of their doctrinal knowledge and it also adds that the candidate should understand the historical and sociological context of the Japanese Christian churches. As it also emphasizes that the candidate should possess broad ministerial skills. The last addition in the church order shows that there is a contextualized point regarding the examination because the church is deeply rooted in the Japanese culture. However, the main intention of the examination of the candidate remains the same. In the church order of the Synod of Dort, we find that the examination of the candidate should be done by the classes in the presence of the deputies of the Synod. 
Similarly, the church order of the churches in Java specifies that the examination by the candidate sh of the candidate should be conduct conducted by the classes together with the representatives from the local congregations within the, within the classes in the presence of synod delegates. The fact that this requirement is still kept within the Reformed churches in Java or Indonesia in general demonstrates that the Reformed churches in Indonesia understand the importance of careful examination and, uh, in the election of ministers. This shows that the practice of the Reformed Church has a lasting impact, so, so that even after more than 400 years since its inception, it is still strongly held by these churches in Java. According to the Synod of Dort, once the local congregation receives the classes' approval to call a candidate into ministry, and after it has announced the name of the candidate for two weeks with no objection from anybody, the public ordination of the minister should be held in the presence of the congregation with, here I quote, proper stipulations and questions, admonitions, prayer, and laying on of hands, end quote, by the ministers of the local congregation and others who are present. It is not too surprising for all of us by now that the Reformed churches in Indonesia keep a similar regulation according to the, the ordination. The local church should announce the plan to, uh, uh, to ordain the minister for two successive Sundays, and when there is no legitimate objection to the plan, the church will ordain the church in the presence of the congregation. All of its bearers in the church must be held up in a very high standard. This requirement is common across all the churches, whether in Geneva, in the Netherlands in the 16th and 17th centuries, or in the Dutch East Indies in, uh, in those days, and in the Reformed churches today. The last point I want to raise here is the practice of censura morum, of the office bearers prior to the celebration of the communion. Article 81 of the Church Order of the Synod of Dort states that, here I quote, ministers of the word, elders, and deacons shall exercise Christian censure among themselves and admonish one another in a friendly way concerning the exercise of their offices, end quote. This practice is intended for office bearers to remind each other to repent from sins and to live according to the word of God. It is usually done on the Sunday before the Lord's Supper. The same practice is still kept in most Reformed churches in Indonesia today. Ministers and council members will meet at church on the Sunday before the Lord's Supper to pray together and to examine their own lives and to pray for God's forgiveness of sins that they have committed. This is a good practice to ensure that office bearers help each other maintain their healthy spiritual life as they also carry that of their congregation. In conclusion, the practices of the Reformed churches in Indonesia I highlighted in this presentation do not just a demonstration of the keeping of tradition for tradition's sake. It is about the way the church stands in the world amidst the challenges that it must face. It amazes us, and it also gives us a sense of joy that the practices started centuries ago remain standing today. It tells us that the teachings and beliefs of the Reformation that got translated into church practices and rituals are solid and worthy. Doctrine and practice must go hand in hand. The church's high view of the Lord's Supper without having to embrace the, literal, the literality of transubstantiation or consubstantiation, for instance, is translated into its conscious effort to remind the congregation and office bearers to live upright according to the word of God. Liturgy shapes the life of the people, and not just a set of motions that people do at church. The keeping of solid, well-structured form of liturgy guides church members into a life in the presence of God every day. Even a short statement from Psalm 121 verse 2, our help is in the name of God, the creator of heaven and earth, can stand as a sturdy source of strength for the people who live as religious minority and often persecuted all their lives. Together with this, the recitation or the singing of the Apostles' Creed every Sunday helps build solid structure of people's um, spiritual lives. While I understand that a ritual we do regularly can tend to become old, boring, or losing its meaning, I would argue that there is more benefit than downfall of this regular practice. It builds people's faith, as I said, and in the presence of challenges and attacks, 
that churches and church members face almost daily in that part of the world, this practice works in strengthening the faith of the believers. And perhaps that is why for these churches in the global south and east, it is still held strongly as a lasting impact of the Reformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karin, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here to represent Brazil. And my presentation is entitled Beginnings, Bent, and Booming. So three Bs in order to understand the flow of the presentation. So I'm going to start talking about how does Presbyterianism or the Reformed Church in Brazil started. Then we used, we're talking about some bents or beliefs or characteristics of that church to this day. And I would like to close with the booming resurgence of the reform tradition in Brazil that is happening right now. So beginnings, bents, booming. Beginnings. The reform tradition started in Brazil very early in the day. Brazil was discovered in 1500s by Pedro Alvarez Cabral. We have a Brazilian here who can fact check everything I say. <laughs> and in 1555, a, a guy named Nicolas Durand de Villagagnon, a French guy, was sent to Brazil to explore the coast. And, and then in 1557, he wrote to Calvin, say, Calvin, we need some missionaries to go to that area and to preach the gospel to that land because it's very promising. So in 1557, Calvin sent two pastors and 11 lay people to be there in Brazil. And they were warmly received by Ville Gagnon, and they started well the ministry, but later on they had some disagreements, uh, especially because of the sacraments, the way the sacraments were administered, and Ville Gagnon uh, ended up challenging them to go back to Catholicism, and they did not like that. We're going to go back to Calvin. <laughs> so they took the next ship to Calvin, uh, to Geneva, and there's some guys who stayed in the country because they really thought God had called them to stay in the country. So five of all the, the men sent by Calvin stay in the country. Three were very barbaric, executed because of their faith, and two fled. And they produce a beautiful confession, is Guanabara Confession, which states pretty clearly what they believed as faith in Christ and the Reformed tradition. So that's how we start business in Brazil. A lot of blood, a lot of persecution. You have to remember the Portuguese were there before the Frenchmen came. They were the colonizers per se, so they did not allow any other religion to swing over to their nation. So that's the first attempt, the Huguenot attempt. The second one is the Dutch Reformed. They arrived there in 1630 with Mauricio de Nassau, that's not the way he says in Dutch, but it says how Brazilians approach them. So the Dutch reform, they had a much more lasting impact in the country. They stayed in the northeast side of Brazil. They did a lot of good, a lot of preaching, a lot of development. They were very modern in terms of technology, in terms of education. So they tried to bring all of that to Brazil and they have a clash. They had a clash with the Portuguese and the indigenous people because the Portuguese, they were more soft in the way they treat each other, not as rigid, especially in terms of trade and business. Whereas the Dutchmen were very rigid, and if they don't have the punctuality thing right on time, and they would just ask for a lot of taxes and a lot of money. And so the indigenous people didn't like that. Um, Portuguese didn't like that, the black man didn't like that, so they ended up in a huge battle in 1654 where the indigenous, the black, and the Portuguese kicked the Dutch out of the country. But in terms of impact, the Dutchmen really tried to implant the reformed faith in Brazilian soil. And one of the evidence we have for that is that there's a first Brazilian church, Protestant church, Igreja Reformada Potiguara, Reformed Potiguara Reformed Church, which lasted for many, many years, 
That was the first church, half Dutch, half indigenous. To such an extent that they brought the first pastor to the Netherlands to receive his training before the canons of Dort. So the, the Netherlands was still very strong in the face. So this guy was trained and eventually went back to Brazil, but he was unable to um, live out to preach the gospel because the whole colonization process was just a, a failure. That's the, f the second attempt, the Dutch Reformed. And then the third one was really the one that came to stay, was the mission Protestantism. And why it took so long, you might ask, why it took so long for the Protestantism to establish itself in the country? Because independence in Brazil has taken place in 1822. Before 1822 in Brazil, Brazil was just a colony of Portugal. It would be like medieval Europe, so to speak. So there's just one religion, and everybody who tries to oppose to that will be killed like a heretic. So with the independence came also the freedom of religion, little by little. Catholic faith was still the mainstream and official religion of the country. And that statement in the Constitution remained until 1988. Catholics were the official, Catholicism was the original and official religion of the country until 1988. So, but other religions were tolerated after 1822. So because of the trade, the opportunities of making money, a lot of guys from the Episcopal Church came down to Brazil, the Anglicans, the Lutherans came to the south, and little by little, missionaries started coming. So the first group of people, they're just there because of the immigration. So I have the first Lutherans in the south. They just wanted to uh, do business with the natives of the land, and also because they need to worship, they invited their pastors to come over. But they would preach in Dutch or in German or in their native language. No connection to the Brazilian community. As a matter of fact, I visited one of those churches uh, five years ago. I was preaching a Mennonite camp where they used to have their services in German uh, until year 2000, just to have an, a, a little bit of background of what was going there. So it was just immigration church. It was not missional. Same thing with uh, the Anglicans. But then the breakthrough was when a Scottish missionary came to Brazil, a congregationalist, Robert Calley, was the first one to plant a Brazilian church for Brazilians. That was 1855. And then a couple, uh, couple years after, Ashbow Green Simonton, a follower and disciple of uh, Charles Hodge from Princeton Theological Seminary, he came down to Brazil as a missionary, um, and he stayed there for, do you remember how many, how long? 1859. 1859, and died about 10 years after, a lot of diseases, but he planted one, through two, three churches, a seminary, a newspaper, and a lot of good things in Brazil. Was very, very fruitful, his ministry, although very short. So that was basically the inception. And this missional bent of the church really lasted until this day. So that's the, the mission. So then came the Methodists, came the Pentecostals, came the Baptists, and all sorts of denominations. But I would claim that after quite some time, Presbyterianism remained the biggest branch of the Reformed tradition in the country. There are some attempts of the CRC to come to Brazil, but it was very unsuccessful. RCA has some attempts. Canadian Reform tried, but they basically, uh, they were, they stayed with their communities and they did not expand to other places. So basically they, they were restricted to their own camps or fields. So the second part now is the bands and the beliefs of this Brazilian Reformed Church. I would highlight at first that no Presbyterian, no Reformed Christian in Brazil until very recently was consciously about its Reformed identity. So we are very Protestant in nature to the point that in the 50s, 1950s, that was an attempt to merge all the denominations all together and to form just one Protestant church, have one seminary for everybody, 
It's because it was very eclectic in terms of doctrine. So some characteristics. First one, the Bible. Bible was so important for Reformed Christians in Brazil to the point that they were called by the pagans or non-religious or the Catholics as the Bibles, or Biblia. Because if you see a Protestant or you see a Reformed Christian in the, in the streets, it's, he's always carrying a Bible. So they were called, oh, here comes the Bibles, the ambulant Bibles. Because every lay people was encouraged to read the Bible, and they used to know it very, very well. They're ferocious readers of Scripture. So that's a very important characteristic of Brazilian Presbyterianism, of Brazilian Reformed Christianity. The second one, very anti-Catholic in nature. If you try to, if you say the word Catholic, <laughs> that's something that for some will cause some sort of allergy. Uh, they, they are very anti-Catholic in nature. They don't like to really compromise in anything related to Catholicism because, not because of their, they just came up with that, but they were persecuted for centuries, killed for centuries. They don't want to relate to those people anymore, which was very sad for Christianity in Brazil because when Protestantism came, there was no affinity, no friendship, no connection with Catholicism. It's just hatred from the get going. So it's very anti Catholic, very Bible oriented. Number three, very concerned with education. Early Presbyterian churches, they would, if, if you plan to plant a church, you have to plan to start a new school at its side. So a new church, a new school everywhere in the country. That was the motif for church planting and for expansion. So to this day, the Protestant churches in Brazil, they have contributed to education in a way that we cannot measure. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of school, hospitals, orphanages, and nursing homes. Uh, right now, the Presbyterian Church of Brazil has the largest private school in the country, Mackenzie University with something around 50,000 students. So it's really, really large, very influential in the whole country. The fourth bent or belief or trait of this church in Brazil is it was very missional. It's not about us. It's not about our migrants. It's not about our ethnic group. Because Brazilians are so mixed, there's no way you can say, oh, that's a Brazilian trait in terms of face, body. No, they're so mixed that there's never this ethnic boundary um, hindering the church to expand. So the church spread from all cultures, from all peoples in every parts of the country. Very missional oriented for the gospel, for church planting. Um, and number five, very theologically eclectic. Again, if you go to a seminary, uh, let's say Reformed or Presbyterian back in the 50s or 60s, you would read a lot of Carbart. <laughs> you would read a lot of theologians that are not very considered by some very Reformed, at least not with a good pedigree. So there's room for lots of different views. So the three theologians that are very prominent back in the day was Augustus Hopkins Strong, Shedd, and Charles Hodd, of course. But those are the three that have been used. Just for you to know, Calvin's Institutes was translated in Portuguese only in 1985. Before that, there was no knowledge about Calvin. Whatever they knew about Calvinism or the Reformed faith came through Ashbel Green Simonton, the pioneer, or from the Westminster Confessions and Standards, or from the second-hand theologians of the day. Burkhoff, for instance, was translated in Brazil in the same year I was born, 1990. And Kuiper, first material translated about Kuiper, 2002. So that's a little bit about the theological overview of, of this church is very eclectic in terms of theology, not self-consciously about its identity, but very Protestant in nature. Bible, missional, um, education-oriented, 
and so on and so forth. Now the, the last part, the booming section. What's going on in Brazil? Just give you some statistics. In 1980, Protestants in Brazil, they would make up 6% of the population. Brazil has now around 220 million people in terms of population. So in 1980, just 6% would declare themselves Protestants. In 2010, 2010, 22% now declare themselves Protestants. And 2022, the year we're now, 35%. Did you see some progress happening? <laughs> and so let's try to understand that. First of all, Pentecostalism really took over the whole nation. The majority of these Protestants, they are Pentecostals or independents or non-denominational oriented. But Presbyterianism, Baptist, Methodist, and other historic denominations are growing as well. Presbyterians now in the country, they, the total sum of them are a million, million members. And they are steady growing. They're never going down. They're always growing, but little by little, since 1859. And, but there's something that is really changing the characteristic of the country. If you go to a a church back in the 90s or the year 2000, they would be very Pentecostal, oriented toward gifts or new revelations or prosperity gospel or all the novelties of the marketplace, religious marketplace. But nowadays, the charismatic movement is very dissatisfied with the churches are offering them. So they're going back to the historic churches, especially those who have a solid Bible preaching and especially those who have a substantial doctrine to offer to their members. So there's been a boom of members going to Reformed churches. I'll give you one example. In Brazil, I, I pastored a church for seven years. In my first year, we had 350 members. And the last year I was there, before I came to Calvin, we had around 900. It was a, a little bit of growth. <laughs> and most of this growth came from... Pentecostals or people deluded or very frustrated with the experience they had before. So it was a process of re-discipling them in the Bible and teaching them good and sound doctrine. Um, and how this grow is happening? I mean, what is the method? What is the process? Eber Jr. was an um, alumni from this seminary, which was, he was a great mentor for me. He was my prof in my seminary training, and the master's, and he remains a good friend of mine, he wrote an article explaining what is happening with the Brazilian Presbyterian Church or the Reformed Church in general in terms of growth. There are four avenues, he says, that we can measure why these people are coming to Reformed faith. Why is the Reformed faith so prominent nowadays in Brazil? First of all, literature. There has never been such a great impulse and publications around Reformed theology in Brazil today as never before. So we can, I can point to you thousands of books that have been translated or published by natives about Reformed theology, about doctrines, about biblical theology from a Reformed perspective. It's just immense. So literature, books just being traveling all over the place. Second, theological conferences. Brazilians love going to conferences. I'm not sure the Americans. But the, the last conference I visited it was Fiel Conference in Sao Paulo. We had 6,000 attendees. And what are you talking about? Reformed doctrines, doctrines of grace. They would invite international speakers, the native speakers, and they would just teach the Bible, 6,000. Another major conference takes place in the, in the north of Brazil, conscience, Christian Conscience, or Consciência Cristã. They gather together in a whole week, 100,000 people. That's what I'm talking about here. So there's a real resurgence of the reform faith. Third, social media. Now we have the capacity to make information travel without going. We can just text, we can make a video and publish online and have the information traveling for you. 
And there's especially in the Presbyterian Church of Brazil, two characters, Augustus Lopes and Hernandes Diaz Lopes, two Lopes, he knows very well them. If you go to their Instagram profile, they have millions of people, millions of views. And they're rock solid preachers, very reformed. And these guys are well known, public exposure, very visible in the nation. Uh, it's very interesting what's happening through social media. And the fourth, theological schools. <laughs> well, of course, there's some room for theological schools to expand doctrinal and theology. So there are many schools in Brazil, um, independent, denominational, just the Presbyterian Church of Brazil, as far as I know, have 11 seminaries in the country. Others have tons to a lot of online teaching going on. So those are the four avenues of growth or that are hap helping the resurgence of this movement in our country. Um, and this resurgence has not generated a homogeneous movement. So there are lots of reform branches in Brazil now. I will point just four. Number one, the historic group. Those who have always been reformed, they're still there since the inception. We have the second group, which is a more social group. Once they discovered Abraham Kuyper and the idea of all the sovereign, uh, sphere sovereignty stuff, they're now about changing society and cultural transformation, all that. You know that. So we have guys thinking about how the gospel shapes our lives in the everyday life. The third is the evangelical group, which is the biggest one. The Baptist, Pentecostals, Methodists, Independent. They don't want the liturgy. I'm sorry, Yuda. They don't want the liturgy. They don't want the institutions. They don't want that. But they want the soteriology. They love Reformed soteriology. They discover the fact that it's by grace through faith alone. They love that. It's not by merit. It's not by works. But their liturgy is very fluid, spontaneous. There's no rules. They're just very fluid. But when it comes to preaching, it got to be something solid. So no liturgy, but good soteriology. They have very little exposure to tradition. As a matter of fact, in this church, if you mention the word tradition, it may be stoned. <laughs> and the fourth one, the fourth branch, I would say, is the pure or the Puritan branch of Reformed. Are more radical and belligerent or more militant towards the truth and they want to go back to the Puritans in the 17th, 18th century and try to imitate them uh, and try to go back to the piety they had and if you, go, if, if you want to know if you're in a Puritan church Psalms only, women are all quiet um, no calendar, no ecclesiastical calendar it's just the word of God and they're very strict relating to the Sabbath, Sabbath keeping. And they very ferocious in the social media trying to just ban everybody who is not a faithful reformer or reformed Christian. Very militant and belligerent. I'd like to conclude then, after giving you this overview, the beginnings, the beliefs or bents, and the booming, the recent booming, with some challenges. And for that... I'll use three Bs. The first one, what are the challenges? In, I mean, looking at the scenario in Brazil nowadays, what are the challenges the Reformed faith has to deal with? First one, I would say to beef up our knowledge of our good tradition. I think that's very important. For all the groups that I mentioned here, it's important to go back, to read our forefathers, and try to get whatever good they did in the past. I'm not saying to get whatever they did in the past, but whatever is good right there in the past. And recover that, retrieve that. So beef up or put some flesh in these bones. And I would say at least three things that I really enjoy about our tradition. Number one, it's missional bent. Brazilian Reformed Church was always a missional from its inception always sending missionaries all over the world, always involved in urban missions, always planting new churches. I think that's a good thing to retrieve, this missional activity. Number two, the Bible focus. 
If someone accuses you of something, the first question that should come up is, show me in the Bible. <laughs> That's what every Reformed Christian in Brazil would say, show me in the Bible. Otherwise, freedom of conscience. Number three, how our faith shapes our daily life. Another very important thing to retrieve. It's not only about the church, it's not about the liturgy, it's not about the preaching, but how we live from Monday to Saturday. Second B, or second challenge, is to bow down and confess our sins before God. In the Reformed tradition, we have many things we don't like, especially this fundamentalist, militant, belligerent, violent, aggressive inclination to say we have the truth and everybody's wrong. That's something we should confess. So I confess. I come to the Lord and I, I get sad and feel the sorrow for the ways my own church behaved throughout the, the centuries. So we bow down, we confess. Sometimes our excluding mindset, our belligerent approach, our dogmatic priority over practice, over evangelism, over ministry. Oh no, but are you doing with the right theory? We're always trying to track who has the right theory, right theory. And I think that's not a good approach for ministry. And lack of action. A lot of opportunities in the country we just lost. We're always the last in the line. We started using the social media because the Pentecostals were using the social media. We started going to TV because others were doing. So we're always the last in the line. And last, so beef up our knowledge of our tradition, the best we have, bow down and confess our sins, and third, boldly continue to reform our churches according to God's word in every area of the church life. Um, it's not only to go back and imitate what our forefathers did. It's not only to go and look forward and try to do everything new, but it's to go back, look what they have done, go to scripture, see our own challenges, and try to understand how, what God is calling us to do in our own generation, enforced, enlightened, and strengthened by God's word. So thank you very much. Right, I'm going to jump in right ahead. Um, so what do you think is wrong with this picture? By the laughter, I think you figured it out. That's right, we have actually two flags out there, but I think this picture has three flags. If you don't know, the new one is actually the Korean flag, and I put it there because I think it deserves to be there. Uh, for those who have been around Calvin Seminary long enough, you may have noticed that there, is, there are a lot of Koreans around here. I am Korean myself, of course. And um, some time ago, I went to a supermarket, and I happened to be talking to an old lady, a very nice lady, and she, she asked in the middle of the conversation, do you study at Calvin Seminary? And I said, yeah, how did you figure it out? Well, you look, you look like one. And I was like, okay, fair enough. Um, so even the whole city knows that Calvin Seminary has been already dominated by Koreans. Um, but I want to ask you, have you ever wondered why that's the case? Is it because Koreans are weird people who go to places that are difficult to live, where it snows all the, si all the time and it is freezing cold during the winter, when, where you have actually like, for me it feels like you have half the year is winter here. Or is it because we have the best looking president over here? I wanted to have a picture here. Or is it because, as you see in this Apple map, Calvin Seminary is, in fact, secretly Korean Presbyterian Theological Seminary? And by the way, this is not a fake. And I've actually emailed Apple that this is a mistake, but they, have, they haven't fixed it yet. I think all these theories are quite convincing, especially the good-looking president one. But in order to really dig into the question, we need to travel back in time. And we actually if we want to really find out why we have such a big reformed community in Korea, we actually have to travel a few years. So we go back to the year 1882. Now, 1882 was a very important year for Korea and the Korean church, but nothing religious happened in that year. In fact, what happened was very political. 
In that year, the treaty between Korea and the US happened in 1882. In fact, it was the first treaty that Korea ever had with a Western nation. Its content was uh, pretty standard. The co two countries were to have peace and friendship. They promised re reciprocal rights of residence and protection of citizens and all that jazz. Surely all these political issues are important, but there was something else that changed the course of history. What this treaty did for the souls of the people in Korea was simply this. The Protestant missionaries began to come to the Korean peninsula. The first ever American Protestant, Protestant missionary to set foot in Korea was a medical doctor named Horace Allen. He came to Korea in 1884. Now, what kind of pro Protestant do you think he was? He was Presbyterian. Now, the first ever American Protestant missionary who was also an ordained minister was named Horace Underwood. He came to Korea in 1885. Can you guess what kind of Protestant he was? Presbyterian. He was, in fact, actually, he went to an RCA seminary in New Brunswick. So he was actually more reform, more related to us than, than we think. Uh, but he was sent by the Presbyterians in the US. And in the year 1901, the first ever formal Protestant theological education took place in Korea. This small gathering turned into the first Protestant seminary in Korea in 1903. They created seven ministers in 1907. The whole thing was started by a missionary named Samuel A. Moffat. Now, can you guess what kind of Protestant he was? Presbyterian, of course. Now you see the pattern. You see, I'm not trying to say that all the Presbyterians were the good guys and they were the only ones who evangelized Korea. I'm not saying that. And they, I'm not saying that they are the only ones that matter. Instead, I am a drawing a picture for you, a picture that explains why we have so many Koreans at Calvin Seminary and why Korea happened to have such a large reformed community. Since the beginning of the Korean Protestant church, there were Presbyterians, there were reformed people. So here's my first punchline. I would like to say, it's always the people. It's always the people. It's the people, not money, that shapes a country's fate. It's the people, not just institutions or rules or, or anything like that, that determine a church's destiny. Of course, in a seminary like this, God is always working through them, and that is absolutely true. But it was through the people as opposed to finance, institutions, rules, or coincidences. God worked through people. And these people were not just any Presbyterians. These were passionate and capable people who shaped the Korean church from its very start. Horace Allen, who was the first Protestant missionary in Korea, founded the first Western hospital in Korea named Chejung Wan. He also established the first formal Western medical education place in Korea as well. With this kind of ability, he must have made a great career. He would have made a great career in the US as a doctor, but he, he sacrificed his youth and career to serve the people in Korea who at first doubted him and even hated him. Horace Underwood, who was the first ordained Protestant missionary to Korea, taught the modern sciences to Koreans. He co-edited one of the first Korean English dictionaries in history. He founded the first orphanage in Korea. He even fought against the Japanese empire for Korea's independence. Samuel Moffat, who founded the first Protestant seminary in Korea, opened his house to his students and taught the first seminarians at his home. He deliberately chose a city that was badly damaged by a war, the seminary that truly became the center of Christian, Korean Christianity of the early 20th century was built by him. So I repeat the question, why are there so many Presbyterians and reformed people in South Korea? Why is the reformed community in Korea impacting its nation in such a profound way? It's always the people. For these three people and countless others who came to Korea and dedicate their lives for the Korean church, I would be eternally grateful. Now let's move to the next point. If I ever wanted to do some propaganda, which I would never do, I would have said something like this. 
God sent these wonderful Reformed people to Korea so that Korea could be a true crown jewel of the Reformed tradition. Or God wanted Korea to have the truth, so he sent the Presbyterians to that land first. I'm not saying that God didn't send them, but that was not the point. That is not what I'm saying at all. It is simply that it is simply true that the first Protestants who came to Korea, sacrificed their everything, served the country, and moved the hearts of its people were Presbyterians. But that is not everything. That is not the whole picture. You see, there were many other groups of missionaries, too, in Korea. There were Methodists, Baptists, and all sorts of missionaries in Korea. As time went on, things got crazy. Different missionaries from different denominations, from different countries, did the different things in a very small peninsula. Things began to go wrong. People began to fight. Things were not very orderly at all. There were six major denominations of missionaries in Korea around 1910, and the leaders of these denominations got together to work it out. And these denominations were two American Presbyterian churches, one from South and one from North, in United Church of Canada, Methodist Episcopal Church, Methodist Episcopal Church South, and Australian Presbyterians. The leaders got together and talked about how to overcome the issue of having so many different denominations in one small country. After spending a lot of time exploring different options, they all came to a conclusion together. They said, let's forget about denominations. Let us make one Protestant church of Protestant Church of Christ in Korea. It would be wrong for us to build a Korean version of the denomination that we are originally from. So most missionaries loved the idea, and the Korean Christians who heard the news were also very thrilled with the thought as well. So these missionaries wrote to their home countries and they wrote to their denominations and asked them if they could do this. And turns out, once they received the letters back, People back home were not happy with this ecumenical idea at all. So the people were appalled, but, you know, they got together again and they brainstormed, like good Christians would, and they finally came up with this map that was created around 1910, and this is called the Map of Korean Missions. What happened was that they decided to divide Korea into six sections, and each denominational missionary would work with their own region alone and not bothering each other. Now here's something really interesting. Here comes my second punchline. Location, location, location. So historically and sociologically speaking, locations do matter. When the missionaries divided the sections, Presbyterians Americans all had the very important locations for the missions in Korea. Was it because they were there already? Maybe. Or did it happen to be that way? Maybe. We don't know for sure. But in any case, the Northern Presbyterian Church of America took the parts which included Pyongyang, which you know as the capital of North Korea. So we think of it as, oh, that's probably not the best place to be. But back then, it was a very significant place for the Korean church. And it continued to be the central place of Protestantism for decades to come. And the Northern Presbyterians uh, also took Seoul, as well as other major cities in the southern part of Korea. And the Southern Presbyterians took the southeastern part of Korea, which was and still is a very strong Christian region. So as the central places of the Korean church were allocated to the American Presbyterians, the Re Korean Christianity could not but be influenced by the reformed heritage and identity so very significantly. Now, what happened after the map of 1910? In 1932, they uh, counted the Christians in Korea, and there were 280,000 Christians in Korea, Imagine that, you know, they first came in in 1884, but by, but by 1932, they had 280,000 Christians. And out of those Christian believers, there were 210,000 Presbyterians, and there were about 47,000 Methodists. Obviously, I'm not saying locations do explain everything, but there are certain correlations. So I repeat my first two punchlines. It's always the people, Location, location, location. Now I have only three punchlines, so I'm moving on to my last point. And I am going to reveal my third punchline right away. 
theology matters. If you look at the history of world missions, if you look at the whole world, it usually takes about at least 30 years for the missionaries to get the Bible and hymn book going. These are the essential for worship. Once this initial stage passes, missionaries begin to think about theological education and theology books. I'm talking about at least 30 years. So in many occasions, it takes more than that just to have the bare minimum for the Korean church to have the bare, sort of, for the church to have something to work with. Theological education and books often come after more than 50 years later. I've told you that the first Presbyterian missionaries went to Korea in 1884. When do you think the first Protestant theological publication took place in Korea? It is, in fact, 1908. So it only took about 24 years for, that, for them to have a proper theological publication. And this is to a special lecture called John Calvin in 1909. And the, these students are not, not really experienced Christians. These are the people that just became Christians. They wanted to become pastors. So these people are not really familiar with the Bible itself yet. But he was trying to teach them about Calvin and his theology. And I think that is fascinating. Also, when you look at this uh, first Protestant seminary's curriculum, you also find that the missionary professors were really serious about church history and historical theology. When you look at the records of 1916, which is still very early stage for the Korean church, we find that they taught things like life and thought of Calvin and life and theology of John Knox. And of course, Koreans were really eager to translate the book by Henry Mitter, that, of course. And uh, this book was translated as early as 1950s. And this is, they actually reprinted it, so there is a high demand for the book by Henry Renek called The Basic Ideas of Calvinism. So I brought this from the Meter Center. And what was also very significant was that the missionaries did not want to keep teaching these Koreans. This is not a mean thing at all. They actually wanted Korean professors at the seminaries. So they encouraged some Korean seminarians to study abroad. In the very early days of the Korean Protestant church, some Korean pastors were funded by the missionaries and the churches in America to study in the US. We do not quite know how that happened, but it did happen. So when these Korean pastors returned to Korea beginning in the 1930s, which is still the early age of the Korean church, they were able to help the Korean students understand and learn theology better because the students were now learning from fellow Koreans. Not that the missionaries were not great teachers, but because there were less linguistic and cultural barriers. So if you ask me why the reformed heritage and identity are strong, still strong in Korea, my, my answer would be because theology matters. Or you could say teaching theology matters or theological books matter. Now, all good things come to an end and my presentation should now be concluded as well. I was trying to answer the question, what kind of impact did the reformed faith have on Korea? And why and how did the reformed faith leave an impact in Korea? There were so many things to talk about, but I had to be selective, so I wanted to leave you, if you could remember anything, with three simple lines. It's always the people, location, 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 and theology matters. It's always the people. The first Protestant missionaries were Presbyterians who lived out the Reformed faith and taught it to the Korean Protestants in a really faithful ways. It's also about the locations. Sociologically and historically, locations matter. Just like Luther's Reformation somehow happened in Germany, perhaps. Finally, theology matters. The first very teachers of the Reformed faith in the Korean Peninsula lay the foundation of its work, and we Koreans are still carrying on the good work. Thank you. So what I'd like to do now is invite Jean and Yuda and Sam up to the front so we can have some question and answer time because they've covered some wonderful topics for us and I think there may be indeed lots of questions. So you can go ahead and sit if you like. There's lovely chairs for you. Um, and I have a microphone. I can pass it round as people have questions. Um, 
I'd like to start, I think, maybe with you, Sam, and then when, when the, someone asks a question, then you can just go to the mic to answer, okay? Um, I was wondering what you can say now about, because I know that there are in Korea different Presbyterian groups. Now, how does that work exactly? Because I know, I mean, the Presbyterian family is a big family. Do the members of that family work together at all or not so much? Something that I couldn't really cover was that um, until the independence of Korea, we've always had one denomination for each Protestant denomination, so one Presbyterian church, one Methodist church, and that was the way missionary re missionaries really intended. Mm -hmm. So if I had more time, I would have covered the mm -hmm. sad history mm -hmm. of uh, Korean churches, schis not schisms. Yes, Schis separations. Yeah. Yes, separations. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, but I would really love to talk about that, but that is also really sensitive issue as I well. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. I would not like to discuss it in a globally no. live no, no, stream no, session. No, no. But I, <laughs> I'm really glad I didn't cover that. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, oh yeah, exactly. No, I mean, it's, it's unfortunately true that within Protestantism there is a seed of separation, and that's, I think, true in, in every context. Thank you. Other questions or comments people want to make on these? Con let me just bring you the microphone. I'm interested in hearing from each of you a little more about the social impact of the Reformed churches in your countries. Uh, Calvin was very strong on a care for the poor by the, the state as well as the, the church. Uh, we had that in the Netherlands with Abraham Kuyper too and uh, in some other areas where the Reformed churches have been. And I wondered if that is being carried on in your countries. Well, I guess I'm holding the microphone, so I'll go first. Um, that is a fascinating question. And I, I think in my presentation, I kind of highlighted the positive parts that the Korean church had historically. But I would say that because our growth was really fast, we didn't really have time to cover the social aspects. I think a lot of the people were more interested in evangelizing the nation, so that came so the social aspect of reform tradition came a bit later, I would say. And partly because the Korean church kind of lost its heritage after the Korean War because the war destroyed pretty much everything. So because they've forgotten about it, and after the Korean War, we had a very big, um, again, I should be careful here. Some will call it Pentecostal movement and others will call it um, prosperity movement, prosperity gospel movement. So with that, people didn't really have that reformed emphasis on the social aspect. So I regret to say that's the case. But now things are changing really positively. I should not take too much of my colleagues' time. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention three. Uh, the first one is on education. Uh, it's also partly uh, because of the Kuyperian um, uh, influence in, at the turn of the, of the 20th century. Um, Christian day schools, for instance, are, are there in many, many parts of Indonesia, and, and I was part of, uh, of that. I'm the beneficiary of that. So uh, education and then healthcare. Um, the Dutch came uh, opening hospitals in many, many parts of Indonesia. If you think about Indonesia, it's a country of more than 17,000 islands, so it's, it varies, but there are pockets of uh, strong Christian uh, presence, reformed Christian presence, and uh, there were hospitals uh, there. And um, again, a bit uh, of a, a personal story. I was born in one of those um, hospitals uh, um, built by the Dutch, um, and as I was doing my research, I found the hospital where, where I was born, and I found even the OPGYN, a Dutch woman, who helped me come into the world. Uh, it was so exciting, you know, learning about, about uh, your, your the research and then about your own life, so um, uh, healthcare. And also, uh, 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 care for the poor in general. So um, churches in Indonesia, uh, the deacons have special funds, not just for the poor members of the family, or of the church, but also uh, to take care of the, of the society, the, the, the poor in, in, uh, around that church. So three, three things, yeah. I think in Brazil, a very similar thing happens so because of the reform bent is very educational in nature, mm -hmm. 
So the fact that in every church we have the idea of building also a school was very important for educating people as part of our mission. Because if they are educated, we can then preach the gospel to them, and then we can teach them the Bible. Otherwise, it would be very hard. So education, number one, huge impact in the nation. Not only the Reformed, but also the Roman Catholics. Uh, number two, healthcare and hospitals, orphanages, they're all over the place. And one thing that has recently been a great thing in the Protestant churches, the care for those who deal with addiction. Mm -hmm. My church, for instance, in Brazil, they have two um, real estate properties just to care for the addicted, um, alcohol or any other kinds of addiction. And I would also add early Presbyterians were very concerned with politics. So we had some, a good number of senators, congressmen, and even some running for president. Um, but I think after the 60s, because of the threat of communism in Brazil, the people are very careful dealing with the social arena of life. But now in the year 2000, 2010, the resurgence of the, uh, the importance of being in the public arena basically resurged. So there's, I would say most Christians nowadays, not only reform, they are very aware of what's going on in the justice arena or Congress or whatever is happening. So they're very in tune with social issues. Thank you. Other questions? Well, if not, we'll continue our conversation with the refreshments. But before we go on to that, please join me again in thanking our panel.